You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And I guess you've already noticed we have a couple of surprises here. We've got a new intro to the podcast that we've recorded. We're basically given everything kind of a facelift, and this is the episode where we debut the whole thing. Um, so we've got a new intro. We've got a new outro. We got some new graphics, not terribly new, but slightly new. And we've got um, a new tagline, uh, learn, grow, and worship. We just think that's a great uh, encapsulation of what we're trying to do here with the podcast. We want to, we always want to learn something new and exciting about what God has made or about God's word. And hopefully that will help us to grow closer to him as we learn these things. And, and then eventually that brings us into a, an attitude of worship. So we thought that was a pretty good tagline to retire our old one with. Let's not even mention that one. That was, that was a placeholder that <laughs> stuck around for far too long. But okay, now we've got a new one. And, and the big news, the exciting news, uh, let's talk creation.org. That's right. We've got our own website now. So no more corsi.org slash podcast. Now you can go straight to letstalkcreation.org. Check out all the back episodes. Check out all the show notes. Check out uh, information about us and find ways that you can support um, Core Academy or BCT in uh, the work that we do on producing this podcast. And we definitely want to thank all of our uh generous supporters and donors um, for uh, coming through with a lot of financial help to help make this possible, help us continue the work that we're doing. So thank you. And I hope yeah, you really enjoy you. the new website. Okay, let's see. What else do I have to tell you? Important stuff. I got a whole checklist here, Paul, because it's a lot to remember. So <laughs> let me go back over this here. Oh, yes. Don't forget to like our episode uh, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Um, if you're listening on a podcast platform, we'd love for your uh, reactions there. However, your podcast platform records reactions. If you could do a review, that'd be great. Um, every little bit helps to spread the word about what we're doing. And if you like the work that we're doing, then yeah, help us out. All right. So this episode is a special episode. Back at back in the holiday season, Paul, we mentioned that um, we were going to do episodes that you could basically sponsor an episode if you wanted to make a, a contribution. And so this is one of those episodes. Um, our production schedule is quite full and somewhat time sensitive a little bit. Um, so we can squeeze these in as we can. I know we've got one other one that's been sponsored. That's going to take more effort on our part to do the research. So that's going to have to be maybe in the summer but when we get to that one, um, just because it's a little more complicated. But this one, this one was near and dear to my heart. So we definitely want to thank our <laughs> listener. His name is Paul. He made this contribution to uh, hear about Behemoth and Leviathan. So... Thank you, Paul, for your support. And here's your episode. I hope we don't disappoint. Um, yeah, like I said, this 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 subject is oh my goodness. I I love this. <laughs> I love this to an inordinate degree. Um, and I've loved this uh for a very, very, very long time, as as we'll see as we get into it. Um now the usual disclaimer applies. Um we're not biblical scholars. Uh, we do not have degrees in Hebrew. I don't actually read Hebrew. I know a lot of random trivia about Hebrew, but I don't actually read it. So uh, understand that going in, that we're, we're going to be summarizing things that we've read from experts and some thoughts that we have on our own. And so, you know, ask, ask an expert and your, your answer may differ. That's okay. We're just going to give you what we think, and that's our opinion. So, Paul, can you start us off with um, 
what what is what even is this? What is Behemoth and Leviathan? Why are, <laughs> why are we even talking about this stuff? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is going to be a fun episode, I think, because as you say, um, it's it's near and dear to to our hearts. It's something that we have thought about in the past, but probably haven't um, written too much about. I think no. Um, no. Uh, so let's just set the scene then. I think by reminding people about the Book of Job. Uh, that's that's where uh, we're headed. So the Book of Job um, is a book that uh, maybe one of the oldest books in the Bible. Certainly, the setting seems to be the kind of patriarchal period. And Job is a man who, uh, as many of our listeners will know, uh, loses absolutely everything uh, in a, a kind of series of disasters that befall him. Uh, he loses his livestock. He loses his household servants. He loses even his children, and then he loses his health. And uh, he spends most of the book. Uh, it's kind of a series of speeches where Job is dialoguing with a group of friends, and uh, it's all about whose fault is it that these disasters have befallen him and. Job uh, declares that he is innocent, that it's not due to some great sin in him. Uh, but most of all, what Job want, wants to do is he wants an opportunity to go before God and to plead his case before him and to say, God, I didn't deserve you know, these things that have, that have come upon me. And we then come to this uh, section of the book uh, from chapter 38 onwards where God himself shows up in a, in a whirlwind and God makes a series of speeches in response to Job. And the way that these speeches uh, are structured is that they're kind of a series of rhetorical questions that are meant to be uh, answered in the negative so God comes along and says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, Job? Uh, are you the one that brings forth the lightning and, and the hail? Can you control the elements? Are you the one that controls the stars in the heavens? Uh, are, are you the one that can guide the birds in the air and can feed the animals? So, so God is sort of using all of these illustrations from nature, from parts of creation, the animals and the birds, to show that Job is powerless, that he has no mastery over these things, and that God is the one who sovereignly is in control of, of all of this. And these, the, this speech of God uh, culminates then in the passages that mention the two creatures that this episode is going to be about behemoth and leviathan so i think we should sort of have a little look at you know what this passage says about those two animals behemoth comes first so behemoth is in chapter 40 uh, and uh, verses 15 to 24 of job now the the hebrew word behemoth is uh the is is a form of the word behema which is used actually in genesis chapter 1 uh, where it talks about God creating the beasts of the earth, uh, and uh, you know they're, they're created on the sixth day, and they are the behemoth of the earth. And uh, the beasts of the earth, of course, are also mentioned as a category of animals that are taken onto the ark by Noah in in the flood account. And this word behemoth uh, is then used. Uh, in this passage to refer to this animal that God describes. And uh, in this description, it, we have this sort of remarkable series of traits uh, applied to this animal. So this is an animal which in verse 15 of Job chapter 40, we read, was made alongside man. Uh, it eats grass like an ox. It has very powerful loins, belly muscles. Uh, it has a tail like a cedar tree. Uh, it has limbs like bars of iron or bars of bronze. Uh, Behemoth is said to be chief among the works of God. Uh, anyone who wants to come near to Behemoth has to have his sword with him. 
Uh, this is an animal that's a wild animal. It feeds among the wild beasts in the mountains, hides among the reeds and the willows and the lotus in the marshes. It's not frightened by the river when it's in flood. And it's not an animal that can be captured. So that's the description of Behemoth, remarkable animal. And then in Job chapter 41, uh, we have another animal. This is Leviathan uh, described. And the description here is actually longer uh, than Behemoth. It's a whole whole chapter from verses 1 to 34. And the Hebrew word uh, Leviathan actually appears uh, some other places in the Old Testament. I think it appears six times in five verses uh, here in Job, but also in Psalms and in Isaiah. And the word, as I understand it, so the Hebrew scholars tell me, comes from a root meaning uh, twist or coil. So the idea is this is a serpent-like creature. It's a sinuous, coiling serpent-like uh, creature. Uh, in fact, the Septuagint calls Leviathan a dragon, which is very interesting. Uh, and uh, again, we have um, in Isaiah 27 and verse 1, Leviathan, this dragon, is referred to by a word that is also used in Genesis chapter 1 uh, when God creates the great sea creatures, the great whales or the great sea monsters, however it's translated uh, in various um, Bible versions. And that's the plural form of the word that's used in Isaiah to refer to Leviathan. So Job chapter 41, then we have again this sort of detailed description of this creature Leviathan who can't be captured by a fish hook. Uh, weapons are ineffective against him. No human can tame this, this uh, beast. His body is impenetrable. His teeth are sharp. His back is made up of a row of closely spaced, um, closely joined shields or plates. He's exceptionally strong and makes uh, the mighty afraid. Uh, his belly leaves marks in the mud as he moves. And uh, we're told that there's no other creature on earth like him, that, that he is king of those who are proud. So those are the descriptions of Behemoth and Leviathan that we have uh, there in Job. And I guess the obvious question is, what animals are these? <laughs> and that's what we really want to talk about today. Lots of modern study Bibles suggest that behemoth is a reference to the hippopotamus or perhaps the elephant, and that the leviathan might be a reference to the crocodile. So that's what you'll read in a lot of um, study Bibles. However, uh, it's been quite popular among creationists to suggest that perhaps what's in view here is some kind of extinct animal, perhaps uh, dinosaurs or some kind of extinct marine reptile, something like a mosasaur or a plesiosaur in the case of Leviathan, maybe a sauropod dinosaur in the case of Behemoth. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going, yeah. we're going to have a think about what these animals really are. What do they represent, Todd? So, that's right. Yeah. Where do we go from here? You, you got any? You got a? You got any creation books there? Did you? Were you showing me some creation books? I have. Uh, yes, I do have some creation books, and uh, this one. This is a book that came out, I think, in the seventies. Dinosaurs, those terrible lizards, mm -hmm. and it uh, portrays, for example. I think, oh, yeah, I can see meant that to be maybe Leviathan. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, one because we'll come on to this, but one of the interesting things about Leviathan is that he is said to breathe fire. Right. Yeah. And uh, we'll so this there. this book actually has this creature sort of breathing fire, yeah. and there you can see these dinosaurs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well. Yeah. So let me let me give you my background on this because it's it's old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like me. Uh, so I remember as a child, and when I say a child, I mean a very young child. I remember um, I had this dinosaur picture book, and I'm sure 
it's packed away somewhere because I tend to not get rid of my books. I'm one of those kind of people. Huh. Um, right. <laughs> So I got it around somewhere, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't look at it. Anyway, so the, I had this picture book and inside the picture book, there was this page where it said, you know, every page has like a sentence and a big picture. And, and that was, you know, it was for real little kids. And there was this page that said something like, um, no one has ever seen a living dinosaur. And in, the, in this pen, uh, the, my dad had scribbled out no one and he'd written down a re- the, the reference Job 40, I guess 15, that's where Behemoth starts. So, um, and, and I, yeah, it's definitely my dad's handwriting. And I know that my parents, um, when I was very, very young, they had gone to hear, um, John Whitcomb speak and they had purchased a copy of the Genesis Flood. And I know that that made a really big impact on them and probably made a really big impact on me, consequently. And so this is the first time I I can remember um, being connected, connecting the, that behemoth and Leviathan to dragons and dinosaurs. Um, so I was just little. I mean, I must have been three or four. Um, and so... Uh, in, in high school then, um, being turned on to this idea early on in my, in my life and being fascinated by it, I, I had to write this, um, research paper in our English, 10th grade English class. And so naturally I do have this, uh, I wrote mine on sea serpents, sea serpents. Um, this is 1988. Uh, so it's a bit old, um, and in this, I make the argument that Behemoth and Leviathan are best understood to be uh, dinosaurs. And and preparing for this uh, podcast, I reread my paper. Um, it was it's not very good. <laughs> um, it's about what you would expect from a from a you know teenager writing about um, dinosaurs and stuff and sea serpents. So not my finest work. But anyway. Um, so I get to college, uh, then, uh, a couple of years later and I, uh, had to take a uh, freshman comp, freshman composition where they teach you how to write. And so I, you know, I had to write another paper and I decided I was going to just write a sea serpent paper, right? Just update my, my sea serpent article. And that sent me into the university library, which was way different than my local public library, um, which is where I gathered most of my information um, about sea serpents. You, I don't know if you remember this, Paul, but back in the 70s, it was the heyday for Bigfoot and and, and the Loch Ness Monster, <laughs> all that stuff. It was just, yeah. it was everywhere. It was all over TV. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, it was it was a big deal. So, so my local my local library there in in my hometown, my little hometown of Michigan, they just had all sorts of these kind of books. And so I get to the university library, and I discover this book. Now, this is a reprint of the original. Uh, this is uh, called God's Conflict with a Dragon in the Sea. It's written by a guy named John Day. John Day is a was a professor uh, of Old Testament at Oxford, and uh, so I found that using the card catalog, good old card catalog. You remember that? And um, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is this is real old school here. We're getting we're getting back into the real old school <laughs> stuff. Anyway, so I I you know I'm researching this paper, and Day's book is, I would say enormously influential on the way I thought about a lot of different things. Um, it was the first time that I had ever come across a person advocating sort of a higher critical um, position on the Old Testament. So so for those of you not familiar, these, these are the folks who would argue that, that the Pentateuch was written uh, largely after uh, the Israelites returned from exile, that the final version of the Pentateuch is from that time. And that there were parts of it that date back to maybe the time of the kings of Judah, but it's not written by Moses and and so forth. 
And so in this book, Day is trying to argue that that what you have in the Old Testament are these echoes of Canaanite mythology. Canaanite mythology where you would have the gods fighting and fighting with chaos monsters and so forth. And that that was sort of leaking into the Old Testament, even though the various compilers and editors and redactors had tried to stamp out most of this so that they could make it monotheistic, which was the hallmark of the Israelite religion. Um, so so that's, that's where this book is coming from. And Day is arguing, yeah, God's conflict with the dragon in the sea, that's, that's all from Canaanite mythology. He is arguing that this is what you see in the Old Testament, and specifically that that's what Behemoth and Leviathan are. That when you get to this, what you're, what you're actually um, seeing in the text is this echo of Canaanite mythology. And so he's got a couple of things here that I thought that I took out of the book. Okay, so I, I have to say <laughs> it was hugely influential on me, mostly just because I thought it was bizarre. <laughs> and I didn't think <laughs> I didn't think that it sounded very compelling. I'd I'd heard about these higher critic guys, but to run into one was really strange. And much of what he wrote about, I just thought. I don't buy this. I don't buy this at all. We'll talk. I'll give you some examples here. But the real interesting part about Day's work was his um, his discussion of why he thinks Behemoth and Leviathan are not just animals, right? So why is it that they're not crocodiles or um, hippopotamuses? And the two big things, right? Well, the two big things that you you see in description of both is that they're just untamable. You cannot tame them, you cannot control them, you can't even catch them, right? The very opening phrase, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook, right? Can you catch Leviathan with a fish hook? And and it, the same implication is made for for Behemoth as well. You you can't catch this guy. And Day points out, and I thought this is really interesting, that the Egyptians have multiple records of how to catch crocodiles and how to hunt hippopotamus. So remember you mentioned that the the the, the speeches of God in Jonah, I'm sorry, in Job, eh, the speeches of God in Job are intended to be answered in the negative, right? Can were you there when yeah. when I made the foundation of the earth? Um and uh, can you control the lightning and can you control the elements and so forth? And it's always supposed to be just kind of shaming Job and saying, no, you, you don't know what's going on. You have no idea. Um, so for, for to come to this passage, then the, the culmination, the climax of, this, of these speeches and to have Job say, well, you know, uh, we, we are able <laughs> to capture crocodiles with fish hooks. It's possible to do that. Maybe not fish hooks. We can we can capture them and we can capture we can hunt and capture hippos as well. That would be kind of bad. That would not make any sense in the context. And then he also he also mentioned uh, the the tail issue with Behemoth. Right, Behemoth moves his tail like a cedar, and he says, "Look, hippos got a little little stumpy, little coily tail. It's not." There's no way anyone would describe that as like a cedar. It's just not like that. Um, so, so yeah, he he's he's pretty. Yeah, you got an example there. Well, that's a, that's that's with an elephant. Yes, but it kind of makes the point. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, elephants yeah. and and hippos are are not are not really in view here. And so for my paper, that's what I took out of his book. I said, oh, this is great. This is great ammunition against these naturalistic interpretations of these things as being just, you know, hippos or just crocodiles or whatever. And so that's what I got out of his book. Um, but I thought we'd go over some more of his argument because I think it's relevant and important. Um, yeah. So he, his argument here is that Behemoth and Leviathan are Canaanite chaos monsters, that these are meant to represent you know, basically what the Canaanites would understand as being these these terrible, horrifying creatures 
that were defeated as part of creation, that they are, they are subdued during the creation um, of the world. And so, for example, here's, here's a passage from some Canaanite mythology. This comes, for those of you who know all about this, this is from the Ugaritic. Uh, so the Ugaritic is a, is a massive cache of um, clay tablets found in a city that's on the coast north of, north of Israel. And here's, here's a passage from that. Surely I lifted up the dragon. This is, this is a god named Anat. She is a sister of Baal. You, and you remember Baal from basically all through the Old Testament, Baal. So Anat says, Surely I lifted up the dragon and smote the crooked serpent, the tyrant with the seven heads. I smote Arshu, the beloved of Ael, and I put an end to Ale's calf attic. And then there's another passage from these Ugaritic tablets. Uh, in the sea are Arshu and the dragon. May Kothar and Hasis drive them away. May Kothar and Hasis cut them off. Um, so here he has he basically saying, look, here's these two passages, interesting passages in the Ugaritic, where you have uh, connected uh, this idea of this calf, God's calf Arshu, or God's calf Attic. And there, that is mentioned in the same context as this, this Tanin creature, this Leviathan. And it's basically, I mean, it's, it's slightly different, like French words are slightly different from, from Spanish words, but you can still see Leviathan and Tanin, the, the, the serpents that they're mentioning there, it's basically the same word. Um, so, so yeah, so Day is going to argue, no, what's, what's going on here is that, that Yahweh in Job is trying to bring to mind the largest and most terrifying creatures you can imagine. And to do that, he goes to, he goes specifically to the mythology of the Canaanites in order to, to make his point. That that there's nobody above Yahweh, and that these are just these are just um, chaos monsters. So now, at the time, of course, I was starry eyed and in love with sea serpents, and <laughs> and I had I had no interest in his weird mythology um, point of view. Um, now, as I'm older and hopefully more mature. Uh, hopefully, uh, I look at this and I think it's really, I, I just think it's really unusual that the Bible, in multiple passages, not just Job, the Bible uses this term Leviathan, which is basically a word from these these um, Canaanite myths and legend, uh, where, yeah, you would immediately know what I'm talking about. It'd be kind of like me saying God is big enough to beat up Superman or something like that. You would, you would know I'm not just talking about a Superman. I am talking about Superman, right? Um, so I think it's important that whatever way that we sort of read these, these passages and what, however we're going to come up with our interpretations of these passages, we're going to have to sort of wrestle with this this notion that the name's the same, right? <laughs> of all the words that could have been used in the scripture, um God in multiple passages chose to refer to these to this word that's also used for these these Canaanite monsters. So uh and I don't think that I don't think we have to say I don't think we have to say that there's mythology in the Bible. Um, but maybe we'll get into that a little later. Um, Paul, why don't you yeah. tell us tell us about the dinosaurs? How about that? <laughs> okay. Well, there's there's been this long tradition. I'm not exactly sure, you know, when when this began. Yeah, I don't either. But um that would be interesting to know, wouldn't it? When it when would. this kind of first 
f- I, first came up. I've, I've tried to dig this... it up and see who who was the first one to come up with this idea, but I I came up I came up empty. But it's old. It's yeah. very very old. At least yeah, years. it's very old. So, so there's this idea uh, that has this long tradition within at least modern creationism that identifies behemoth and leviathan, as we said, with some kind of extinct animal, dinosaurs, some kind of extinct marine reptile or something like that. And a number of arguments are kind of put forward in favour of this interpretation. So maybe it just helped just to sort of run through this, to see yeah. why people are thinking this yeah. way. So as we've already said, what one major point of these speeches that God gives in Job 38 um, – through 41 is they're demonstrating God's mastery over creation and Job's inability, his powerlessness. And when you read that passage beginning in Job 38, everything it seems that God is talking about there is some kind of feature of the natural creation. So You've got clouds and thunder and hail and goats and horses and hawks. And, you know, so they're all kind of natural parts of of God's creation. So it would seem odd that at the very end, the very sort of culmination of this passage, that God then references creatures which are supernatural or or mythological. Uh, So, you know, that's the first thing it you know that kind of almost seems incongruent with the with the rest of the passage um the the second point is that i th- when you read this dis- the descriptions you know of behemoth and leviathan they sound as if they're descriptions of regular animals i mean powerful animals but animals that people are afraid of that that people can't tame certainly but regular animals, there's there's nothing immediately. Well, may, maybe maybe one thing which yeah. we've already sort of touched on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but but there isn't much in in the passage, at least, that kind of hints that these are supernatural or supernormal animals in in that respect. They they're just kind of wildly dangerous animals that are under God's control, but out with Job's control. And Linked to that, we have the fact that, we, again, which you've already hinted at, that the descriptions here don't really seem to match any living animals. Uh, they don't seem to be a really obvious description of a hippo or an elephant or a crocodile. They, there are aspects of these animals that don't quite sort of seem to line up with, with those identifications. And of course, from a creationist perspective, um, and particularly the modern creationists, where we know a lot more about extinct animals, we we know about you know animals of the past from from our studies of the fossils. It is at least possible within a creationist framework that this could be referring to animals that are no longer alive today. I think that's not an obvious interpretation that's open to someone working within a, a creationist frame. Sorry, a conventional frame of reference because. Yeah. Someone within that conventional model has a very different view of Earth history. You know, dinosaurs yeah. became extinct long before humans. Right. So that option isn't open to them. But for a creationist, at least, that's a kind of uh, that's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, and you've already mentioned this reference, but with Behemoth, you know, this this description of the tail being like a cedar. Uh, that certainly brings to mind. It doesn't bring to mind a, an elephant or a hippo, but it does bring to mind something like a sauropod dinosaur with this sort of massive tail. If, if, when it refers to a tail, it is actually referring to a tail, yeah, and yeah. that isn't a euphemism for some other part of the anatomy. Yeah. Uh, and also, if. What's being referred to there is the appearance of the tail and not simply movement. Some translations talk about the tail moving like a cedar, which so there's some questions there. But nevertheless, yeah, you know, this this tail like a cedar doesn't sound like a hippo. Right. Um now again we've kind of hinted at this already. The one hang up, really, I guess, here, uh that 
might give us pause uh, to reconsider is in the description of Leviathan, where Leviathan in verses, I think it's 19 to 22, is described as breathing fire. Uh, so, for example, here it says, Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Now, obviously, fire breathing is not a feature that we know in living creatures. It's not a feature that we know from extinct creatures like dinosaurs either despite the uh i think this rather wonderful um picture that i showed earlier of this fire breathing uh this fire breathing hadrosaur right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um ornithis ornithiscian so uh i mean that's that's great so so that's odd um the yeah. fact that this thing is said to sort of breathe fire and creationists have gone to great lengths to sort of try to rationalize that in some way yep. to suggest that maybe there are analogs in the living world. Um, things like the hot chemical spray of a bombardier beetle or um, maybe the sparks from an electric eel. And could it be that, you know, maybe some dinosaur had that kind of capability. Right. Um, but it seems a bit of a stretch. Um, it, it, it is an interesting one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that, that, <laughs> that's the, that's the kind of, that's the case for it being some kind of extinct yeah. creature. Yeah. And I think, I think that sounds very reasonable. Once you are, once you are a creationist who thinks that, you know, dinosaurs and human beings lived at the same time at one time. Then it does sort of become quite reasonable to think, well, maybe all these dragon stories and these monster stories are distant recollections and distorted uh, myths that came about from human encounters with these creatures. And so I can see that that sounds reasonable. On the other hand, <laughs> I know, um, uh, you know, even as a teenager uh, writing my little 10th grade report there, I knew. It's really odd that a marine creature would breathe fire. Yeah. Because why would a marine creature, why would, <laughs> I would imagine a flying creature breathing fire, sure, that's cool. Um, land animals breathing fire, why not? But a sea creature who's living most of the time in the sea, what's he doing with all this fire breathing? I, it didn't make any sense to me anyway. Then again, I mean, there's one part of this that we've sort of glossed over so far, and that is, I think, an important ingredient here, and that is that Job is very, Job is written in poet, poet, poetical form, right? It's Hebrew poetry. Yeah. And part of what you get in Hebrew poetry is these fanciful word images where you, you read it and you know immediately what it means. But you also know it's not in supposed to be literal, right? So an example from this passage right here, verse 41, 24, Leviathan's heart is as hard as a stone, hard as the lower millstone. So, I, you know, as a biologist, I know hearts have to beat their muscle. They have to be flexible. They cannot be as hard as stone. Now, I can imagine a really big heart that's really tough and really hard to, maybe hard to pierce or something like that. Maybe it's covered with some pretty thick connective tissue or whatever, but uh, it's not literally as hard as stone because the creature couldn't live with a, yeah. a stone heart, right? So, so maybe it's possible, right, as, as we read this, maybe the fire breathing part is, is, one of those passages, right? Maybe it's one of those passages where we're supposed to be looking at it and thinking, oh yeah, it's it's really scary what it does. Um, and it's not actually breathing fire. So this has been right. so the 
the the crocodile folks are thinking, you know, maybe when it comes up out of the water and splashes the water in the sunlight, it looks like sparks or something. I, I don't I don't know if I buy that, but sure, I guess that's a possibility. So, you know, as I'm thinking about all this, I'm kind of wondering, well, how have people down through the history of the church read this passage? Long before we knew about dinosaurs and such, what did people say about Behemoth and Leviathan? So I looked it up, um, and this is the first time I really ever did this. I've never dug into this. I certainly didn't do it in in high school. I definitely didn't do it in college, um, but it seems relevant. So as it turns out, like most things, the church fathers read this passage in two different ways. And in one way, they would simply understand this to be the creatures that God made, right? So that's kind of the point of the passage, right? That even the most terrible creatures that you can imagine are still God's creations. and They are under God's control and God is sovereign over them. But like with much of the rest of scripture, the church fathers would see this also as symbolism. And the symbol that they chose to emphasize is Leviathan as the devil, as Satan. Um, so it's an interesting parallel here because then they have, you know, Satan, the accuser, shows up at the beginning of the book of Job. He's the one that sort of kicks off all of this disaster that comes on Job by, by accusing him before God and saying, look, Job's, you just bought Job's loyalty. If you take away his stuff, he won't be loyal to you anymore. And then he just disappears. He doesn't come back in the rest of the, in the rest of the book. So by making Leviathan a kind of picture of Satan, it kind of brings the story back around full circle. Satan is in God's control. He, he can rage and he can, he can be scary and you can't control him, but God is in control of him. And of course, as you mentioned, the Septuagint translates uh, this as dragon, right? And so then you go flash forward to, to the book of Revelation, and you see Satan referred to as a dragon, as the serpent of old. So it's pretty clearly drawing parallels with the, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, but also this notion of him as a dragon. Um, and so, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, later on, you get other ideas when you come to, say, uh, Thomas Aquinas um, in the late Middle Ages or the high Middle Ages. Uh, he is going to say that the creatures that God has in mind here are the elephant and the whale. So he's going to try to try to take the literal version of the interpretation as far as he can go and say it's 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 an elephant and a whale. Elephant's the biggest land creature I can think of. Whale's the biggest sea creature I can think of. So that must be it. Um, a couple hundred years later, with the Protestant Reformation, Luther doesn't really refer to these very much, but John Calvin does. And in Calvin's work, he affirms the identity of, of um, the elephant and the whale. But he takes away the symbolism, which is another Protestant tendency. He drops the idea that Leviathan is a symbol of Satan or is meant to represent Satan. So now you have this tendency to take what is written in Scripture and read it strictly and solely and only as what is sort of the literal face value interpretation, the straightforward interpretation. And then you got this French Huguenot named um, Beauchard. And he is the one who, in his work, popularizes the idea that Behemoth and Leviathan are the crocodile and the alligator. Yeah. And Beauchard is actually sort of popularizing the crocodile interpretation. That had been proposed by other people. Uh, but he's the one who originates the idea that the hippo is actually the, the creature in, in view. Um, that it's not really an elephant, that it's a hippopotamus. Um, and that's where the trail gets sort of muddy. You can, you can imagine then with the, um, with the Protestants and their, and their tendency to view scripture uh, non-symbolically, non-allegorically, that, that the hippo and the, and the crocodile become the standard go-to interpretation. 
uh, of of these of these creatures in Job. And so then the missing link in this argument, in this history, I guess, is how do creationists come up with the idea that this is literally a dinosaur, right? And I don't know who right. the smoking gun is. It's really old, as I've said. <laughs> Um, and I've tried looking through our library, trying to come up with who came up with this idea first. I've found a couple of books that have it, but I'm not sure who was the first one. But I do know this. Um, when you look into the literature of the 19th century and what people were learning, people are learning about dinosaurs. Uh, that's really the age of the dinosaur, right? That is when that is when people are starting to dig up these creatures and reconstruct them and try to understand what they are. Um, you have the the fierce competition between um, Cope and um, what's the other guy? Uh, yeah, any anyway, those guys? Cope, Ed, Edward Drinker, yeah. Cope, and oh. Othniel Marsh. Yeah, Othniel so, Marsh. Yeah, yeah, I was having a mental blank there. Yeah, yeah, I did too. So Marsh and Cope <laughs> are fighting over dinosaurs, and they're putting out Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus and uh, Diplodocus and all these great dinosaurs. Um, the famous. Um, Dippy the dinosaur at the Natural History Museum came out of these this the bone wars of the of the late 19th century. So it's interesting then that with Behemoth mm -hmm. and Leviathan, uh, you have these words that are used for really big, giant, scary creatures. And so you could imagine how people would use those words to refer to dinosaurs, maybe just in sort of a poetic way, maybe not trying to say that Job was talking about. Um, dinosaurs, but in the sense that, hey, these are big creatures and we should call them that. So here's a passage from H.G. Wells. You remember H.G. Wells, father uh, in many ways. <laughs> Him and Jules Verne are kind of the fathers of modern science fiction, right? Um, yeah. So H.G. Wells wrote a 1919 novel, The Undying Fire. And in this book, he writes this passage. Uh, Think of all that wonderful fauna of the Mesozoic times, the age of Leviathan. Uh, and then he mentioned some of them and the Mosasaurs and such like monsters of the deep. The world we live in today is a meager spectacle beside the abundance of the earlier tertiary time when behemoth in a thousand forms, Dinotherium, Titanotherium, and so forth, a hundred sorts of elephants and the like, pushed through the jungles that are now this mild world of today. So you have you have in literature then this this notion that yeah, that Leviathan and Behemoth could were, were words that you could use for some of these extinct creatures. So it really only takes, you know, one guy to sort of put those two things together, those two trends together, that using Behemoth and Leviathan to refer to big scary monsters that are now extinct, and Behemoth and Leviathan are mentioned in Job. You just put those together and you have, oh, Job's talking about dinosaurs. And when you're a young age creationist, it seems perfectly plausible that that would be the case. So that's the best I could reconstruct of the history of these interpretations. Yeah, that, that's, that's very helpful. So perhaps, you know, ju just to kind of review some of what we've said so far in this episode and just sort of try to summarize it. Um, we, we've got these speeches of God in Job 38 to 41. They're all about God's mastery of the natural creation which Job has, you know, no hope of, of controlling. Um, and it makes sense, I think, in that context that Behemoth and Leviathan are to be understood as part of this creation, that they are creatures that, that were made by God. Right. However, um, we've also got to take into account the fact that these passages are in a book that is full of poetry and non-literal description. And so I think you know we've got to we've got to bear that in mind because we've got to be cautious that we're not um, understanding every point made about these animals in a, in an overly literalistic manner. Having said all of that, when we just take the descriptions, I think um, at face value, even if we're trying to interpret it in that cautious way, they don't quite seem to match uh, animals like the hippo and the crocodile. Uh, so, so that is a problem, I think. Um, they're not obvious descriptions of those living animals. 
And then we've also got, uh, as you've sort of very helpfully sort of unpacked, we've got the fact that Leviathan is definitely a word that is used in ancient Near Eastern mythology to refer to the some kind of chaos monster, some kind of scary uh, monster that lives in the sea um, that is uh, regarded as sort of mythological. And yeah, that seems to be, you know, the context again, where the original readers of this passage are going to have some of that in, in their frame of reference. They're, they're going to understand the reference there. Uh, and then, of course, as creationists, as we've said, we've got at least this possibility that what we're reading about here is not a living animal, that it could be some kind of extinct animal. Uh, and there are perhaps aspects of the, the passage, but we've mentioned particularly the tale like a cedar, uh, that may point you to some other kind of animal besides one that is currently extant. So does that sort of fairly summarize what, where we've got to so far? So I guess the question next is, you know, how do we put all of those pieces of the jigsaw together and try and make sense of it? Have you yeah. got any thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, do I have any thoughts about that? Well, I, I, I'd say one thing that really sticks out in my mind that's really important. I don't think it's impossible for the use of Leviathan to be intentional. In other words, I don't think it's impossible to imagine that the Bible would intentionally refer to a word from Canaanite mythology. Um, for example, there's plenty of places in the Psalms where God is described as above all gods. He's greater than all the gods, right? And I read those and I think, yeah, he's greater than all the gods because God exists. <laughs> and all those, those <laughs> idols are, are nothing. They're not real. Right. And, and so I understand those to be the references that they're intended to be. Um, and so is it possible that, that passages here are intentionally referring to these mythological words in order to show you this is not a chaos monster. This is a creature that God just made. And it reminds me of um, in Native American folklore, you'll often read about the character of Coyote, right? And Coyote is this this classic trickster character. He's always pulling schemes and scams and stuff. And his stories are pretty funny sometimes. Um, but a coyote is also a creature. It's an animal, right? And and right. you can see it. Um, and so where where the animal, where the Native Americans have encountered this animal, they've also turned him into this in their through their storytelling, they've turned him into this sort of trickster character. And so I wonder if that might be what's going on here. Maybe, maybe these creatures were known to the ancient world, and they gave them this name Leviathan. And then the Canaanites and the Sumerians and the other peoples of the of the region sort of inflated the story of these things into this large mythological thing, so that when the Bible comes along and describes them again in sort of naturalistic terms, it's intentionally sort of kind of taken the wind out of these mythologies, right? By by using this term to refer to the real animal again and to remind Job and the other readers that these are just the creatures that God made. These are not out of control mythology. Forget that Canaanite myth stuff. This is just something that God made. And maybe maybe the answer here is is not, is it mythological monster or is it a natural creature? But it, maybe it's intended to be both. Maybe we're intended to understand these. Right. Both, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? You yeah. got any uh, uh, full good ideas here? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I, I, at one time, uh, if you'd asked me, I think I definitely would have favoured the dinosaur explanation. That that would have been the answer that that I gave, particularly because that was the very common view in the creationist literature that that I was familiar with that yeah. I was reading. Um, I would say that these days I'm not so sure. Uh, about that and you know anymore um i think one of the things that bothers me a little bit about the idea that behemoth is a sauropod dinosaur is that the description in uh in job leaves out what i think is one of the most obvious 
characteristics of a sauropod dinosaur, and that is its long neck. Um, there's no mention of a long neck. And it just seems that that would be such a noteworthy attribute of a sauropod dinosaur that you would think, I know it's an argument from silence, yeah, but you yeah. would think that that would, that would be referred to in a description of a sauropod dinosaur. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. On the other hand, I, I think you're right that modern animals don't quite seem to fit the description either. Um, and the descriptions do sound as if they're meant to be read as descriptions of real animals um, with, you know, poetic, um, a poetic way of describing them, but nevertheless, you know, intended to be natural animals. So I quite like, uh, you know, the idea that you've sort of proposed there. It's, it seems quite plausible to me because it, it still leaves the question of what behemoth and Leviathan are unanswered. <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, I think it is quite helpful in, in, you know, us thinking through, you know, why there's this reference to the Canaanite mythology. And I, I think, uh, we see something very similar in, uh, in other parts of the Bible, as, as you've said, another example might be the flood legends. Sure. Um, we have lots of extra biblical flood legends, um, and they have all kinds of mythological elements to them quarreling gods and arcs arcs that are made of reeds and arcs that are strange shapes and you know all, all kinds of um quite fanciful elements and and yet we've also got a description in the bible of the flood written i think in quite a plain sort of matter of fact sort of style that sort of strips away some of those mythological elements those fanciful elements and perhaps that's what's going on, you know, here in Job. Perhaps Job is describing animals that uh, were real animals, but ones that in the Canaanite mythology had taken on this uh, this sort of mythological significance. And for polemical reasons, in the Book of Job, that mythology is sort of being stripped away to say, no, these are these are real animals, and that they're, they're animals that God has mastery of. Um, so that that sounds plausible to me. Yeah. Where where do you land? Do you think on <laughs> on all of this at the end of the day? Sixteen you know, year old me is all gung ho about dinosaurs in the Bible. Um, decades later, I I uh, that's a whole other journey of sea serpent studies that I did, and it's weird because I I've written thousands of of posts on my blog, and I've never written about Behemoth and Leviathan, so. This is my first public comment. And I'd have to say I'd kind of fall in the same sort of skeptical camp. I don't I don't know that it's it's clear enough for us to say one way or another for sure. So I find myself very uncomfortable when creationists just declare there are dinosaurs in the Bible. It's in Job. That's possible. That's it's possible. Maybe not. Um, so I just I just I don't know. I I <laughs> I I have learned a lot more and I've read a lot more and I've studied a lot more and I'm just I'm just find myself uncertain. I just don't know. Yeah. So our listener to our listener Paul who asked us about our opinion and made a little contribution to this episode. Thank you very much. Um I'm sorry that we couldn't give you more firm answers, but I hope we've given you a lot to think about. I had quite a lot of fun um, yeah. researching this and and studying up on this and reading about it and uh so thank you for your support. And Paul, thank you for yeah. being here and chatting with me about this. Yeah. Um, we'll be back yeah. next time for another uh, fun episode, I hope. So see you then. See you then. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes and all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms, Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.